Stay tuned for an extended look at the massively successful 70s superhero TV shows, The Six Million R Man and The Bionic Woman. The Six Million Dollar Man was one of the most popular TV shows of the 1970s. And here's some interesting facts and trivia for fans of the show. Six Million Dollar Man ran from 1973 to 1978. It was based on the 1972 novel Cyborg by Martin Caden. The series started out as three television movies that were intended as pilots in 1973. This led to five regular seasons that ran from 1974 to 1978. The plot of the show involves NASA astronaut Steve Austin, who was severely injured in a crashed experimental aircraft. The operation to save his life and rebuild him with super strong bionic limbs cost six million dollars. Steve was given a bionic eye that could zoom in images from great distances. His right arm and both legs were replaced with bionic limbs. He could run at speeds over 60 miles per hour. His arm and legs were now super strong powered by nuclear energy. The show used slow motion effects to illustrate the Bionic Man's speed as well as also speeding up the film from time to time. The uh, famous ch -ch 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 sound used to represent Steve's strength was used first in the season one episode Day of the Robot. But then it was used to show the robot's power in the, in the episode, not Steve Austin's. It wouldn't be used for Steve Austin's abilities until later on in the series. Let's take a real quick time out. I just want to remind you to please subscribe, comment, hit the bell for future notifications. The like button helps support the TV Crazy Man channel. Oh, and if you love science fiction, time travel, and good old-fashioned adventure, please check out my Time Cruisers novel series that I wrote. It's on sale on Amazon right now. Thanks, and on with the video. The Bionic Man's major weakness on the show was extreme cold, which can interfere with his Bionic Limb's functionality until it can get warm again. Now let's take a look at some of the actors that played on the show. Uh, of course, the, the main star was Lee Majors, who played Steve Austin, the Six Million Dollar Man. Lee Majors got his first big break on, t on the TV western Big Valley, where he played Heath Barkley. During this time, Majors was referred to a, as a blonde Elvis due to his resemblance to Presley. After the Big Valley went off the air in 1969, Majors played on the Virginia's last season, which had been renamed The Men from Shiloh. After that, he then got the role of Jess Brandon on Owen Marshall, Counselor at Law. From there, he landed the role of Steve Austin, the Six Million Dollar Man. After the Six Million Dollar Man was canceled, he starred in another very popular series, this time in the 1980s. Another series that was also a personal favorite of mine called The Fall Guy, where he played a Hollywood stuntman who also happened to be a bounty hunter. The show lasted five seasons until 1986. It had a big assortment of guest stars, including Lou Ferrigno, Roy Rogers, Priscilla Presley, Jack Kelly, Jonathan Frakes, Don Adams, Frank Gorshin, Larry Storch from F Troop, J.J. Jimmy Walker from Good Times, and many others, like his Bionic co-stars Richard Anderson and Lindsay Wagner, and his Big Valley co-star Peter Breck, who made appearances in several episodes, including a special Roy Rogers Cowboy episode, where he basically played himself acting as the Big Valley's Nick Barkley. Breck also made an appearance on The Six Million Dollar Man. Linda Evans, who played his half-sister on The Big Valley, also guest starred on The Fall Guy. After The Fall Guy, Lee Majors reunited with Lindsay Wagner to do three Bionic TV reunion movies, where he eventually marries the Bionic Woman. The first debuted in 1987, set ten years later from the TV series. The Bionic duo were off doing their own things and had had to come out of retirement to fight a criminal organization called Fortress. We find out that Steve has a son we didn't know about before, who ends up becoming Bionic before the show is done. Lee Major's real-life son shows up on the movie, too, playing an OSI agent. Wouldn't it have been cooler if he, he had gotten the Bonic powers? I'm just saying. I think the first one was the best of the reunion movies. I have to say, though, even though TV reunion movies are a lot of fun to see old characters again, the quality never seems as good as the originals. And according to Wikipedia, the first film ended up number four in the Nelson ratings that week. It was supposed to be a backdoor pilot for the new Bionic Man, Steve Austin's son, but it never came to be. Um, the final time we would ever see the Bionic team up of the Six Million Dollar Man and the Bionic Woman 
was in Bionic Ever After, which aired in 1994. In this one, we finally get to see a happy ending for the Bionic couple, and that alone makes this one worth watching. Richard Anderson played Steve Austin's boss, Oscar. In many episodes, Oscar would show his shock or surprise to a situation by quickly removing his glasses and staring in disbelief. Now, one of the biggest secrets to the success of the Six Million Dollar Man was the introduction of the Bionic Woman, played by Lindsay Wagner. She even got her own spinoff, of course, called The Bionic Woman. That series lasted between 1976 and 1978 and led to popular crossover appearances between the two series, at least for the first two seasons of The Bionic Woman. Now, even though the series was doing well in, in the ratings because it had slipped a little bit and didn't get the demographics ABC wanted, ABC got the very, very bad idea of canceling The Bionic Woman in its third season, which led to NBC picking it up. Personally, I think this led to the demise of both Bionic series as the audience had grown accustomed to the crossovers between the Bionic duo of Steve Austin and Jamie Summers. When the Bionic Woman moved in the third season, she shared most of the cast, but Lee Majors never did any more guest appearances, most likely due to the television network competition, as his show stayed on ABC for one more season. Now, Jamie got a new boyfriend in the third season. Because she couldn't see Steve Austin anymore, he was on another network, on, still on ABC. The character's name was Chris Williams. Now, I'm willing to bet this didn't sit very well with a big portion of the audience. The Bionic Woman did introduce a very popular character in the third season, a dog, a Bionic dog named Max. It's sad we didn't get to see him interact with Steve Austin. It would have surely been a big crossover hit. Martin E. Brooks played scientist Rudy Wells in the show The Six Minute Man and The Bionic Woman from 1975 onward. Kenneth Johnson was a producer on The Six Minute Man and also on the Incredible Hulk series. And he's given credit for creating The Bionic Woman. Now, everybody's favorite Bionic Bigfoot was originally played by Andre the Giant. On the Six Million Dollar Man, the Bigfoot is actually an alien cyborg created by the Shalon to resemble a lower form of life from their world using a technology called Niosynthetics, which is supposed to be an advanced form of bionics. <laughs> The Bigfoot was created to scare away the tourists, basically from finding the uh, alien hideout. Attack, Sasquatch! Now, Bigfoot in the first two-parter was played by Andre the Giant, the famous wrestler. And then Bigfoot was played by Ted Cassidy. Now, Andre would go on to play in the cult favorite movie, The Princess Bride. And during his wrestling career, he was billed at 7 foot 4 inches tall but was really closer to seven feet tall, according to IMDb. Now, he also appeared on an episode of The Fall Guy, Lee Major's utter big hit, and BJ and the Bear and The Greatest American Hero. Ted Cassidy would later take over the role of Bigfoot for the second two-parter that came up. He's widely known for playing the role of Lurch the Butler from the Addams Family in the voice work as the Hulk, the live action series, and voice work for other animated shows. Like, for instance, he was the voice of Godzilla. He was the voice of Frankenstein Jr., a Hanna Barbera cartoon from the 60s. Challenge of the Super Friends, Ben Grimm the Thing, Yogi Space Race. And of course, he reprised his role as Lurch for the Addams Family cartoon. Now this fact is a little bit strange. Both Bigfoot actors died on a January and both at the age of 46. I guess the ages of their deaths might not be quite so unusual once you consider that they both had been diagnosed with acromegaly, a disorder that results from excessive growth hormone after the growth plates have closed. Now it's, I guess it's this condition that made them perfect candidates to play Bigfoot, due to their increased stature of course. Then the last time we saw Bigfoot on the Six Million Dollar Man was the uh, episode Bigfoot 5 on the last season of the Six Million Dollar Man. In this episode, Bigfoot was left behind by his alien creators. He was awakened while going through a process to make him fully adapted to life on Earth. 
And then, of course, he goes on a rampage, because what else is he going to do? He's Bigfoot. The Bionic Bigfoot was so popular, he got his own toy action figure. Well, actually, two. The first Bigfoot toy came out in 1977 in the form of a racer. It's the Six Million Dollar Man and Bigfoot the Bionic Beast. Drag Race Dynamite. Bigfoot sits on a bionic cycle, and you can race the Six Million Dollar Man, uh, which, of course, never happened in the TV show. Now, in 1978, the regular Bionic Bigfoot figure was released. The figure included a switch that opened a panel on the front of Bigfoot, showing off his Bionic mechanisms that were inside. Now, the logo on the toy was based on the likeness of Ted Cassidy, uh, and the Six Million Dollar Man and the Bionic Woman, unfortunately, were canceled in the spring of 78, which ended the popularity of the entire Six Million Dollar Man toy line. Most doll-style action figures from this time period usually range between 8 and 12 inches tall, but Steve Austin was a whopping 13 inches. He had a telescopic bionic eye that a kid could look through via a small eyepiece in the back of his head, and he also had a plastic skin on his arm that could be rolled back to reveal mechanical parts. Now the coolest part of these features on the Steve Austin figure was that he, he had bionic strength. If the owner twisted his head and pushed a button on the back, his arm could lift up to two pounds, of course. Not a lot, but you know. This feature was even cooler because he could make uh, bionic sounds when Steve was lifting things. And they even gave you a miniature car engine packaged with the figure. Uh, just to demonstrate his strength. Uh, in 77 Steve was given a bionic grip and the bionic woman figure came with bionic hearing and of course you had Steve Austin's boss Oscar who had a figure with an exploding briefcase. If you opened it in a certain way it would show an interior that appeared to be scorched by some sort of an explosion. Now besides the uh, bionic Bigfoot Steve could also fight Mas Mascatron and uh, he he was a cyborg with a plastic face that you could that covered up his robotic face, and he had other masks that would uh, let him look like Steve or Oscar. And of course, the Bionic Woman got a Fembot action figure to uh, for her to fight against. And other toys included Bionic Mission Vehicle, the Command Console, and the Mission Control Center, OSI Headquarters Playset, and the Venus Space Probe. Now, in the episode, A Bionic Christmas Carol, Steve visits the toy store, and you can actually see a Six Million Dollar Man action figure on the shelf behind the counter. The Robot Maker first appeared on the first season episode of the Six Million Dollar Man, Day of the Robot, and then on two more episodes, Run Steve Run and Return of the Robot Maker. The Robot Maker could easily be confused with the Fembot creator, Dr. Franklin. I beg your pardon? Uh, he was speaking to me. Oh, sorry. Interestingly enough, there doesn't seem to be any connection between the two doctors and their robots, even though both doctors used the same tactic of replacing Austin's boss, Oscar Goldman, with an exact robot duplicate. Let me introduce myself. I'm Dr. Chester Dolans. I believe you're familiar with my work. In his first appearance, the robot maker is referred to as Dr. Dolans. In his second appearance, he introduces himself as Jeffrey Dolans, and in his third and final appearance, he introduces himself as Chester Dolans. No explanation for the name change is given. Perhaps he just didn't want people to know his real name. Now, on a trivia note, the actor who played the robot maker was Henry Jones, who appeared on an episode of Silver Spoons. The actor John Houseman, who played the inventor of the Fembots, played the grandpa on Silver Spoons on a regular basis. Houseman also played Bionic Woman Lindsay Wagner's father on the 1973 movie The Paper Chase. On the first Robot Maker episode, Day of the Robot, the Robot Maker wants to steal a top secret anti missile device, so he kidnaps Major Sloan, who is a friend of Steve Austin, and replaces him with a robot, which leads to an awesome fight at the end of the episode between Steve Austin and the robot. Now John Saxon played the first robot in Major Sloan. Well, that was a neat trick, Fred. Did I do it right, Steve? No. He showed up on a lot of classic TV series like Starsky and Hutch, Wonder Woman, Bionic Woman, The A-Team. 
Probably his most famous role was on the Bruce Lee movie, Ender the Dragon, in 1973. For the final battle of the Day of the Robot, Steve Austin barely managed to pull out a win due to the robot hitting his human arm. Steve only managed to win when the robot jumped down to attack him while Steve grabbed a steel girder with which the robot basically impaled himself on. In the second appearance of the Robot Maker in the first season episode Run Steve Run, Dr. Dolans, the Robot Maker, has been hired to build a team of robots to rob Fort Knox. And he doesn't want to start working though until he's discovered the secrets of the Bonding Man who defeated his first robot. Therefore, he spends his sponsor's money and time following Steve Austin, who happens to be taking a vacation at a ranch. After watching Steve outrun a horse, The doctor's thugs shoot Austin with tranquilizer darts and capture him. He escapes and captures the thugs, but Dolan's himself managed to get away. Strangely enough, there wasn't any actual robots in this episode, unless you count the ones in the memory flashback. Now, in the third and final appearance of the Robot Maker in the second season episode, Return of the Robot Maker, Dr. Chester Dolan's replaces Oscar Goldman with a new and improved robot. This was the first time this happened to Oscar, but not the last. Fembot creator Dr. Franklin would create another duplicate robot of Oscar in a three-part crossover between the Bonic Woman and the Six Million Armed Man, Kill Oscar. Stay out of it! I bet you never guess who won that one. I give up. Now back to the return of the robot maker when Oscar was first replaced with an evil robot. After an epic bionic battle between Steve Austin and the robotic o Oscar. <laughs> Austin knocked the head off the robot Oscar, Dr. Dolan's is carted off the jail. Now the robot maker, to my knowledge, never got his own toy, but it's a good bet that the robotic Mascatron was based off either the robots created by the robot maker or Dr. Franklin, the creator of the Fembots. In 2014, though, a comic book set in the Six Million Dollar Man TV universe showed that Mascatron was developed by Oliver Spencer as an improvement upon Bionics, and the robot in the book disguises himself as Steve Austin before going rogue. Just a quick reminder, my name is Tim Frady, and I have a lot of fun books for all ages at Amazon, including my latest, which is a comic book featuring a superhero named Liberty Ace, who stands for Old Fashioned Truth and Justice and a Punch in the Face to the Bad Guys. Uh, but even a perfect show has its technical goofs, small they may be. Sometimes they're actually kind of funny when you think about them. You think this first goof, Steve Austin has just been in a plane crash in the desert. His eyes have been temporarily blinded, even his bionic eye. In this scene, Austin is asking a passenger if he's seen any air rescue. Of course, the script says no uh, at this point. It's too early in the show for a rescue. But yet, if you look really carefully, you'll notice the sender either needs glasses or this is a goof because thanks to high def video, we can see a plane flying in the background at the exact moment the senator claims there are no planes in the air. Any sign of air rescue? No, at least not yet. Well, you want to give it to me straight? In the episode Act of Piracy, Steve Austin jumps into the water, clearly wearing green socks. But in the water, it appears he's wearing flippers. Now, where in the world did he get those? But then when he gets out of the water, he's completely barefoot. Okay, he could have took his socks off in the water. I get that, but still. In the same episode, the bad guys take off in a boat, and there's only four of them. But just a few seconds later, they get another passenger from somewhere. I don't know where. In the episode Stranger in Broken Fork, Steve Austin jumps from a moving truck. But who lands is definitely a stuntman, and definitely not Lee Majors, even though he played a stuntman in his next series, The Fall Guy. This one I think is really interesting. On the second season episode, The Bionic Woman Part 2, during the scene where Jamie and Steve are jumping over a fence, we see a ladder at the corner of the picture. 
that according to the DVD commentary by Kenneth Johnson was placed there so that they could jump off of it, thus creating the illusion of jumping over the fence. I think I would have been crushed to know this particular trick as a kid back in the 70s. In the Season 3 episode, The Return of the Bonic Woman Part 2, Steve has nothing with him when he first starts running towards the bad guy's compound, where the Bonic Woman is already. Yet, as he gets near the plant, suddenly he's wearing a side pack, and his shoes have changed from dark to white. I wonder if that had anything to do with the tendency back then to reuse stock footage. I mean, I know they used to have stars wear the same clothing over and over again so they could reuse old shots. Think of Bonanza or Gilligan's Island. In Season 3's The Deadly Test, there's this really cool scene where the six-man armed man throws a rocket at a van with a bad guy in it. But if you look really closely, you can see that the rocket is actually on a visible wire as it heads towards the van before it explodes. <laughs> In Season 3 is The Secret of Bigfoot Part 1, if you look really closely, you can see crew members hanging out on the side. Now, in this scene, this is where the six men our man has chased Bigfoot, he's went into the mountain, he passes out, and the aliens are wheeling him in in his gurney. Just keep a close eye on the gurney, on the reflections, and you'll see the crew members staring back at you. In Season 4 is Death Probe Part 1, the probe attacks a farmer. The farmer shoots at the probe and then does what people always do on old movies when they run out of bullets, they throw the gun at the monster or Superman or whoever it is instead of reloading it. Uh, the probe grabs the shotgun and then starts to turn it. It's then we see what looks to be a gloved hand helping the probe's arm turn. Look at the bottom right and we'll slow it down so you can see it a little bit clearer. See if you can spot this goo from Season 4's episode, Danny's Inferno. Austin jumps off a tall building that is under construction with a teenager on his back as he's in a big hurry to get away from the bad guys and stop a bomb from blowing up a dam. Did you spot the goof? Let's slow it down just a little bit more. Notice that the kid's legs on Austin's back have shrunk dramatically. It's obvious that the kid has turned into a dummy. You know, the stuffed plastic kind. Now, the Six Men Iron Man also had a lot of comic books over the years. Char originally, when the show was still on, Charlton Comics published a Six Men Iron Man comic book series and a black and white giant size magazine series and a Bonic Woman comic book. Interestingly enough, the great Neil Adams actually did some work on the Six Men Iron Man comic book and magazine series. In 2014, the Six Men Iron Man Season 6 comic book was released with photo and painted variant covers. And a mini comic book series was released in 2018 that featured G.I. Joe, a real American hero, versus the Six Men Iron Man. Now, of course, the entire series, both the Bonic Woman and the Six Men Iron Man, are available on DVD. Hey, thanks for watching. Please subscribe, hit the bell for future notifications, and thanks for watching. Have a great day.